Now for tonight, I'm going to introduce our guest author. Alexander B. Rossino is an award-winning author and historian. He's a resident of Boonesboro, Maryland. He worked at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum from 1994 to 2003 and is the author of Hitler Strikes Poland, Blitz, Blitzkrieg, Ideology and Atrocity. He has also written numerous scholarly articles and book reviews. And uh, Dr. Rossino has published a two-part series of historically accurate Civil War novels, Six Days in September, a novel of Lee's Army in Maryland, and then The Guns of September, a novel of McClellan's Army in Maryland. And he also authored a groundbreaking study in Savas Beatty's Civil War Spotlight series titled The Tale Untwisted, George McClellan and the Discovery of Lee's Lost Orders. Uh, and actually this he co-authored with Gene Thorpe. Uh, Thorpe, yeah, Gene Thorpe, Thorpe. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> mixed <laughs> my, uh, my letters up there. But uh, so anyway, um, he has written a lot on uh, the Maryland campaign and he's here tonight to talk to us about his most recent book, Their Maryland, which I, if I understand correctly, is not quite out yet, but uh, it is uh, something that will be coming out very soon and we will have available in our shop. I'm going to turn the screen over to our guest author. Should I push share screen there or Kelly? Great, okay. Yes, we'll hit share screen. And, and I will. Can anyone see my screen there? Good. Okay. So um, one, one, one little correction to, to, to issue there, uh, Kelly, is that um, their Maryland is actually out. Uh, I just received copies last Friday, and um, I will be mailing them, starting to mail out signed copies and inscribed copies uh, this weekend. Uh, I'm finally getting the mailing uh, materials. It was delayed about a month. It was supposed to come out in October. But supply chain issues um, really caused some problems. So uh, I'm glad that it's finally here. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation and welcome everyone. And thank you for attending. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, come here and listen. Um, my This book uh, is the product of uh, 10 years worth of research uh, that originally um, uh, manifested in or ended up being uh, the basis for my novel, Six Days in September. And then uh, I decided later on that I would uh, expand it and, uh, and continue my research uh, because I had a lot of material that I never got to use um, and turn it into history. Uh, for our agenda today, let me uh, get this to work. There we go. Hold on. Okay. So um, for our agenda today, um, what I'll be discussing are really chat the issues that are addressed in chapters one and six. And uh, the first chapter is on uh, whether Robert E. Lee hoped to foment rebellion in Maryland in, 18, in September of 1862. And then also what his defensive strategy at Sharpsburg was and how those two things relate because they are closely, closely, closely related. But as you can see from the other chapters that are here, the other chapter listings here, that there are a number of different subjects that I cover. It is not a comprehensive history of the Maryland campaign. Rather, it was my attempt to uh, re-examine the history of the Confederate part of the campaign, the Confederate side of the campaign in 1862, and to establish the truth about some issues um, uh, when it proved necessary. And the reason I say that is because over the years, there are a number of things, as in all, all sorts of history, that have kind of crept into um, the historical uh, narrative that uh, are either old tropes that were established a long time ago, but uh, really aren't valid. Uh, there are also new ideas that have been posed based on interpretations of the evidence that I don't really think are very convincing. So uh, I wanted to um, try and get to the truth of certain things uh, as I could. And so I look at a variety of different issues. You'll see that the, uh, the, the second chapter, for example, deals with the crossing of the Army of uh, Northern Virginia over the Potomac River and what the hopes of the troops were uh, and compare those also with what the hopes of Robert E. Lee were to see if there was any daylight between the two. And then after that, I took a look at Confederate encampments near Frederick City and realized that there were certain things that I was finding that 
kind of where we're changing my opinion about what um, uh, what happened with the lost orders. So the loss of Lee's orders and then the discovery of those uh, by uh, Northern troops and then eventually how yeah, they fell into McClellan's hands. Um, the fourth chapter is on the uh, interaction between Confederate troops and civilians in Maryland. So how they were received, uh, the, the type of support they received, the type of animosity they received because they of course received a good deal of both. Uh, then chapter five actually takes a deep dive into the background or whatever history I could find to put in co into context that famous photograph of Confederate troops uh, marching on the street or stopped on the street, the column that stopped on the street in Frederick, Maryland. And then finally, the, the uh, chapter number seven is on um, actually uh, tries to determine where Robert E. Lee was on the field at Sharpsburg during the battle and uh, when, and so what he may have seen and what his role was in the, uh, in, uh, the command, uh, taking command during, during the battle. So uh, moving on to our subject today, why did Lee move the Army of Northern Virginia into Maryland? So some of the reasons that were given by him were to, to feed his men, uh, to recruit for his army because uh, as many as 20,000 Marylanders had already crossed over the state line into Virginia and had joined the Confederate Army, and many of them, or most of them, were in uh, Stonewall Jackson's command. Uh, at this time, there are no corps in the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, there aren't wings, really, either. It's really just, as they refer to it, as Jackson's command and Longstreet's command, and then Lee, of course, uh, being uh, directing both of them. Lee also said that he wanted to take the offensive um, into Maryland in order to protect Richmond. So this is kind of like the proactive offensive, right? So we need to take the fight to them in order to make sure that McClellan's army or any army, any federal army doesn't return to the James River Peninsula and uh, try and approach Richmond from the east. So Lee wanted to push the war north of the Potomac River. And he also mentioned an, in passing uh, a possible invasion of Pennsylvania, but we'll discuss that a little bit more as, uh, as time goes on. Some of the reasons that are given by others um, include also the strategic dilemma. Uh, and that's a term that is used by, or was coined by Joseph Harsh, who wrote uh, Taken at the Flood, uh, which is a very large history of the uh, Confederate campaign in Maryland. And uh, the strategic dilemma goes as follows. Uh, Lee's army was too weak to attack the Washington fortifications. So he couldn't move in that direction, couldn't move east. Uh, couldn't remain in Northern Virginia due to a lack of food and fodder for his uh, men and their animals. He couldn't retreat to the Rapidan River uh, because it would give up the summer's gains and it would also mean that his men had spilled blood for no reason and that would have demoralized the troops. Uh, but he also couldn't retire into the Shenandoah Valley to find food for his men uh, because it invited um, a federal overland advance uh, on Richmond from the north. So if you take all of these things together, the standard argument today that you'll read in most histories of the Maryland campaign uh, are that first, that Lee had no choice after second Manassas, but to enter Maryland. And uh, second, that the Maryland operation was defensive in nature and not offensive in nature, because again, Lee had no choice. So, in the strategic dilemma, let's take a look at that in detail. Um, so where did this claim originate? It actually started with Charles Marshall, uh, Colonel Charles Marshall, who was Lee's aide de camp uh, at the time uh, and during the war. And um, in the 1876, the Count of Paris uh, claimed in a volume of his uh, three volume history of the American Civil War that Lee had entered Maryland with the intent to incite rebellion. Marshall took exception to this. And he responded in a letter uh, in the following year outlining Lee's reasons for the campaign. Now, Marshall didn't say that this is what Robert E. Lee believed necessarily. He simply put it as Lee had no choice but to emperor, enter Maryland for the reasons that the strategic dilemma ended up including. Um, and so it was really his opinion that, uh, that he was giving and explaining to uh, the Count of Paris um, that, uh, this, this, that his, his viewpoint was wrong and that Lee really had, to, had no choice. And it was really a defensive operation, again, uh, to protect Virginia by moving north. Well, Marshall's papers were then published in 1927, and that was in time for Douglas Southall Freeman to use them and to spread Marshall's claims, right? 
So most scholars, most scholars still today uh, co consider the strategic dilemma thesis as proposed by Marshall uh, valid. But there's a problem with this. And the problem is that there is no evidence from Robert E. Lee that he ever considered the options that Marshall said he did. Um, he did say the things that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, but he also stated in his uh, summing up his reasons for the campaign in his August 1863 uh, campaign report that he moved his army into Maryland, and I quote, to prolong a state of affairs in every way desirable. So by this, uh, he meant, of course, the fact that the federal armies were in disarray, uh, that Lee found himself in control of the field, uh, that he had the option to move in whatever direction he wanted to move, but that he wanted to move north and he wanted to um, keep the federals in front of him because he wanted to inflict further injury upon the enemy, as he stated. So Lee ends up uh, appearing, if you read the documentation, he ends up coming, uh, coming out of this as almost like a wrestler. So if you imagine uh, two men uh, wrestling and um, one of them's got the other one by the lapels and he's not going to let them go. So that's Robert E. Lee and the way that he looked at the federal army at the time and what the situation was at the time. And he was not going to let the army of uh, the Potomac or any federal army that's uh, the remnants of the army of Virginia, which he had just destroyed at second Manassas. He's not going to let, uh, let give them any chance to recover um, and wants to keep pressure on them as much as possible. He also repeatedly referred to the operation as an expedition. Now, the use of the word is interesting because it implies an element of discovery, right? So, for example, he said in, 18, in uh, September 4th of 1862 in letter to Davis, he said twice that he was persuaded of the benefit that would result from an expedition into Maryland. So to find out what it is that they could possibly make happen in Maryland. Or... Uh, and additionally, to uh, see if the results of the expedition would justify it, uh, an entry into Pennsylvania. And then after the campaign was over, he returned to the word or using the word expedition uh, when he described what his army had just gone through. So if you take all of the evidence in context, and of course, there's a lot more of this in the book than I have here on the slide. These are just a few points that I wanted to hit. Um, the only existing evidence really shows that Lee intended to keep pressure on the Federals as much as possible, and that he hoped to enter Maryland in order to discover something. But the question is, what did he hope to discover? His goal in Maryland, according to Robert E. Lee, in addition to feeding his men and uh, maybe recruiting and pushing the war north, et cetera, was also to incite, uh, incite secession. So on September 3rd, he writes to Jefferson Davis, if it is ever desired to give material aid to Maryland and afford her an opportunity of throwing off the oppression to which she is now subject, this time would be the, seem to be the most favorable. Uh, he followed that up two days later with another letter confirming to Davis that the army was about entering Maryland with a view of affording the people of that state an opportunity of liberating themselves. So this is twice that he said it before his army is actually, before much of his army is actually moved into the state. As of September 4th, D.H. Hill's troops had already started to uh, enter the state at Nolan's Ferry. Uh, so three days after that, when he is in Frederick, Maryland, um, he writes his proclamation, of course, and he writes in that proclamation that his army is prepared to assist people of Maryland with the power of its arms in regaining the rights of which they've been despoiled. This citizens of Maryland is our mission. And I'll get into a little bit later why it is that he wrote that and uh, what it is about his um, thinking that changed uh, as he was in, as when he was in Frederick. And then uh, four days after that, a quote appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Now this is a quote that I had never seen before. Um, and I was surprised that no one had ever used it or dug it out of the Philadelphia Inquirer because here it is in a Northern newspaper. It's available online freely and I had never seen it before. But apparently, while Lee was in, in uh, the Frederick vicinity or Frederick area, he met with or uh, a, a gentleman from Maryland, uh, or uh, this gentleman had overheard a conversation where Lee said something to the extent of, uh, we have now come to redeem our pledge to the people of the state, and we extend the olive branch to them, and should they accept it, we shall welcome and protect them. And that is with the assurance that the next battleground will be in Pennsylvania. However, if they do not come forward after having been amply assured of their prop that their property would be unmolested 
and every guarantee given that the Southern Army should remain on Maryland soil for the maintenance of their sacred rights, then the battleground must hereafter be in Maryland. So the interesting thing about this statement is that it clarifies something that Lee had written to Jefferson Davis earlier on September 4th, where he wrote, should the results of the expedition justify it, I propose to enter Pennsylvania. Well, this clarifies, this statement clarifies what those conditions or the results of the ex exhibition must be in order to justify it. And that is that if Marylanders decide that they're going to revolt and rebel, because remember the state's under martial law at the time, the writ of habeas corpus has been suspended, secessionist politicians have been suspended, have been arrested, um, uh, press uh, outlets have been suppressed or closed by federal troops. Uh, so there are um, a lot of things that have gone on uh, politically in order to um, uh, suppress any kind of se secessionist tendency in Maryland, largely because of the, the state's position just north of Washington, D.C., right? So uh, in order to protect the Capitol and the Union war effort, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of effort has been made to, um, to wipe out or su suppress secession uh, in the state. And so uh, Lee, of course, um, believes that this uh, incites outrage and that um, therefore the results of the expedition, if he justified it, if Maryland Rangers rise up, he'll move the army north into Pennsylvania. If they don't, they're going to stay and they're going to fight in Pennsylvania. And then the final thing that, um, that Lee mentions is in his uh, August 1863 post-campaign report, where he wrote that it was hoped military success, and I interpret that as victory. Uh, I don't see how you can interpret a military success as any other way than victory. Uh, might us afford an opportunity? Might afford us an opportunity to aid the citizens of Mar Maryland in any efforts they might be disposed of to recover their liberties. Liberties. So here we have Lee stating a year later basically what he said on September third and September fifth. So it, it remained consistent the the in his thinking the um, the. Uh, intention to incite rebellion in uh, the state. So what about, what about this and why have historians ignored this in general? Um, so these are just some examples of the kinds of things that you'll read in histories of the campaign. Um, the first one quote that I have here is from Francis Palfrey. Uh, Palfrey was a colonel in the um, Army of the Potomac uh, at the time of the Maryland campaign. And uh, he was actually fought at, uh, at Sharpsburg and was captured there. Um, and he writes in uh, 18, the 1890s that, um, that uh, Lee had a right to expect recruits from Maryland, but not anticipate that, that Maryland would breathe or burn in any exceptional fashion, or it'd be the battle queen of yore. And those are, of course, uh, quotes and pieces of uh, references to the song, Maryland, My Maryland, which was very popular uh, up until the Maryland campaign and afterward uh, elicited nothing but boos and hisses from, um, from Confederate troops whenever Ban tried to play it. Um, so here we have Palfrey who served in the same army as the Count of Paris, um, but the Count of Paris in 1876, he considered secession uh, to be a perfectly legitimate reason or objective for uh, Lee's army to be in Maryland. And at the time, if you look at the newspapers at the time, it was widely held opinion that Maryland, uh, conditions in Maryland were not ideal for, for the Northern war effort. And that uh, there was a widespread fear both in the federal government and uh, in the Northern states among people in uh, the press and things like that, and you know, high society, among people who thought that Maryland could easily erupt into rebellion. So by the time Palfrey's writing, so 30, 20 years after the Count of Paris and 30 years after the, uh, the campaign, we've already started to forget that, um, that, that this, was a, this was an objective. A hundred years later, Stephen Sears gives lip service, pays lip service to the strategic dilemma here. You can see east, west, north, south, all appeared barren and military profit, leaving only an advance northward. Um, but at least uh, Sears uh, acknowledged what Lee wrote and that, um, and that he uh, said that if the Confederacy wanted to give material aid to Maryland to enable to throw off the Yankee yoke, this was the opportunity to do so. Histories since then have completely abandoned that idea. Um, so Joseph Harsh's Taken at the Flood is the uh, one of the two largest histories of the campaign, sorry, one of the three largest histories of the campaign, uh, those being Two Antietam Creek by D. Scott Hartwig 
uh, Harsh's book, and then also the published uh, manuscripts of, um, of uh, Ezra Carmen. Um, and Harsh completely denies that politics had any aim or held any sway over Lee's decision making, saying that his primary reason for entering the state had always been military and not political, and it was less likely that he played much, uh, placed much reliance on substantial support from the state. And then Hartwig agrees in this sense, um, claiming that Lee was not so naive as to think a brief entry and exit of his army across the state would trigger an uprising. Um, so you can see that that this issue or this this um, this uh, theme has been completely lost in uh, Maryland campaign studies today. So the question is, if Lee said many times over that inciting secession or inciting rebellion in the state was his objective, why have historians lost perspective of this? Why don't they consider it one of his primary motives? I have a number of ideas about this, a number of reasons what I think has happened, which is kind of has to deal with the state of the field, um, too. And so the first one is that the strategic dilemma thesis, um, it encourages the belief that Lee had no choice. So um, if he had no choice, then this must have been a defensive operation and it was simply a pragmatic move. Yeah, there was nothing ideological about it. Uh, the second uh, thing is something I've touched on already. Second point is really that accurate memory of the events has been lost. Uh, as I mentioned, period newspapers and uh, others like the Comte de Paris, uh, they thought that uh, inciting secession was a perfectly legitimate uh, goal for Robert E. Lee at the time because of the conditions in Maryland uh, with the suppression of um, the secessionist population there. The third reason I would cite is I think that there's been too much focus on George McClellan and the Army of the Potomac. If you think about it, there's only one full history of uh, the Maryland campaign from the Confederate perspective, and that's Harsh's history. Uh, Hartwig incorporates um, uh, information about the uh, Confederate side of the story, but it's really a campaign history, right? So it focuses on both sides. And then Carmen does the same thing. So. Um, the focus on McClellan really leaves Lee's motive, motives and, uh, and ideas largely unanalyzed. So I think that there's a gap here. The fourth reason I would cite is the Gettysburg campaign. Um, it overshadows the Maryland campaign entirely because of its scale and because of the size of the, of the battle that happens. I mean, the battle at, uh, at Antietam is one full day and then a couple of hours on the afternoon before. So Gettysburg is, of course, three full days of full-on um, a slug match bloodshed between two large armies. So the scale of Gettysburg and uh, the attention paid to that campaign has uh, affected the way people look at the Maryland campaign. They look at it as Lee's first invasion of the North when it was really a very different operation. And to use the word invasion as a description for what Lee was trying to accomplish at the time and what many people believed at the time was probably is, is, is a problematic term. It's a term that if someone uses the term invasion, you can tell that they are looking at things from the Northern perspective um, because the Southerners who were in Lee's, well, uh, Lee's army, you know, is of course all made of Southerners. Uh, in Lee's army, it was liberation. That's the watch word at the time. And um, uh, to have cited it as invasion, uh, when Maryland was considered a southern state, a lost sister state that had never been allowed to, to determine its own fate um, was really anathema. Um, and then last, lastly, there's on this fifth point, there's a written statement that Lee makes to Jefferson Davis or puts to Jefferson Davis on September 7th, where he writes that notwithstanding individual expressions of kindness that have been given and the general sympathy and the success of the Confederate states situated as Maryland is, I do not anticipate any general rising of the people on our behalf. So this has been taken to indicate that Lee didn't anticipate any general rising and that there's no way he could have wanted to foment uh, rebellion when he considered it an unrealistic, uh, unrealistic goal. However, I think that the problem is, is that there's a context that's missing from this, from this statement because Lee says situated as Maryland is, he doesn't anticipate a rising of the people. Not that people aren't willing to rise up. And the reason that he believes that is because Maryland is uh, basically uh, bound in chains as Lee would have put it at the time. So you have a long state line with, Pencil with Pennsylvania, which is of course unionist 
and you have large forces in Pennsylvania that are moving down constantly, recruits that are being gathered at Harrisburg and then coming down the rail line through Baltimore to DC. Baltimore is an occupied city uh, under martial law and DC is of course uh, fortified and is occupied at the time, uh, by the time that uh, McClellan leaves with his army is occupied by as many as 150,000 federal troops. So. Um, you can see what he meant about situated as Maryland is. And this is important because it, it shows that Lee uh, became understood or had a sense of the conditions for, um, for secessionists in the state. So it leads him to explain this paragraph of tortured language that I've included here, um, that Lee believed that the condition of Maryland encouraged the belief that the presence of our army, so the Army of Northern Virginia, would induce Washington to retain its forces against contingencies. So I read that as meaning that Washington would be forced to maintain troops in Maryland and take them out of Virginia in order to make sure that rebellion did not break out. And the reason that people would have rebelled were, of course, it's of course that it had pursued toward the people of that state, martial law, right, which gave it reason to apprehend. Uh, so skipping that at the same time, it was hoped military success might afford us the opportunity, Lee writes, the difficulties that surrounded the people of Maryland were fully appreciated. Um, and he, he then, but then he adds, and this is key, that unless success should enable us to give them assurance of con con, um, continued protection. So what Lee concluded after he had uh, entered Maryland and had been in Frederick for a day or two is that secessionists in the state needed proof of the Army of Northern Virginia's ability and willingness to protect them because people were afraid that they were simply going to move into the state, stay there for a few days and then leave. And that they would leave uh, anyone who joined them, uh, anyone's family, uh, they would leave them at the uh, mercy of uh, the Federals who appeared after the Confederates depart, or the, the, the Confederates departed, excuse me. So how did Lee come to this conclusion and what happened, how did his, his thinking develop? So September 6th is really the critical date here. And the really, uh, that's the day that Lee crosses the river in the morning and he's being driven in a carriage uh, or an ambulance at the time, uh, an army ambulance, because he is of course, at the after the uh, Battle of Second Manassas, shortly after that battle, he's had uh, an accident with Traveler who's pulled him onto the ground and uh, he tried to break his fall with his hands and he broke uh, bones in his right hand and sprained his left wrist and so, his right hand is wrapped up and bandaged and he's got it in a sling and his left hand is bandaged and he can barely use it. He can't write, he can't dress himself. He can probably only barely feed himself at the time. So once he arrives in Frederick or near Frederick um, and sets up his headquarters there, he accepts an invitation to dinner at the Parsonage, which is also the home of Reverend Dr. John Ross, which is right next door to the Frederick First Presbyterian Church. And I have a picture of the Parsonage there today. You can go see it. Um, and visit it. And that's the church right below it. Both of these buildings are still there. And it's fascinating that you can go to these places where these people have been. <clears throat> At that dinner, um, Lee tells Davis on September 12th, so a few days afterward, that he learns that the citizens were embarrassed as to the intentions of the army. In other words, they had no idea why Lee's troops were there. And so he therefore is encouraged to issue a procla proclamation to the people of Maryland in which he stated that our army is prepared to assist you with the power of its arms and regaining the rights of which you have been despoiled. Um, Lee did not initially want to issue this proclamation himself. He invited a man named Enoch Lewis Lowe Jr. who was the former government, governor of Maryland and an avowed secessionist who was in Richmond at the time he asked if Lowe could be sent to meet him and the army in Maryland so that Lowe could be the one to issue um, this proclamation. So here again, we have Lee trying to leverage uh, a person who is uh, a Marylander and an avowed secessionist to deliver a message of, uh, of um, support to secessionists in Maryland in order to encourage rebellion. An interesting fact here is that Lee's army, of course, uh, much of Lee's army, not the whole thing, camps on what's known as the Best Farm. Uh, that's a rented, John T. Best rented that farm. The farm's name is really called the Hermitage and, uh, or Le Hermitage, uh, which is the, uh, the old name for it. And who was born on the Hermitage? But Enoch Lewis Lowe. 
So here you have Lee waiting for Lo at his childhood home in order to deliver this proclamation. So the, the symbolic power of this whole thing is uh, should not be understated in what Lee's trying to do. At that point, from the 6th through the 9th, somewhere between at this point is when that inquirer, that Philadelphia inquirer statement appears uh, or is made and then appears on September 12th, a few days later. And I won't read it again because, you know, we've gone through it once. But the important thing is to, to understand is that somewhere between the 7th and the 9th, Lee concludes uh, a couple of things. One, he includes that the Army of Northern Virginia needs to win a fight in Maryland in order to encourage secession. Um, and uh, he, he uh, hears uh, information that Harper's Ferry is still in federal hands and must be captured in order to clear this, his army supply line through Winchester. And all of this leads to the design of special orders number 191 to capture Harper's Ferry. So I'm not going to go into special orders 191. The map here uh, really describes it. Uh, Lee basically divides his army into four columns and eventually five columns in order to uh, to cap to surround uh, Dixon Miles's uh, uh, garrison, federal garrison at the ferry and capture it. And um, then on September 10th, uh, the Army of Northern Virginia marches out of Frederick uh, toward Boonesboro. On the following day, Lee then proceeds with eight brigades of Longstreet's command and the independent brigade of Nathan Shanks Evans toward uh, Hagerstown and sets up camp in between Hagerstown and Funkstown. Um, at, while they're on route, Lee sees the heights behind Beaver Creek, which is a location about five miles northwest of Boonesboro that I've pointed out here, I've highlighted with the, uh, with the arrow. The reason that this is important is that these heights are very, uh, they're, they're very tall. Uh, they're taller than the ones that are at, uh, are, are behind Antietam Creek. They're 560 feet in some places, uh, and they stretch from the foot of South Mountain on one side to Antietam Creek in the west. So it's a defensive position that Lee looked at and went, wow, this is a great place to potentially uh, engage the Army of the Potomac, which is following us, and because it cannot be flanked. Uh, from, it would have required frontal attacks from, uh, from the Federals in order to uh, have, um, uh, to have uh, uh, captured the position. And as we know from Melbourne Hill, uh, Pickett's Charge, uh, Grant's Disaster at Cold Harbor, frontal attacks tend not to end very well. Uh, Franklin, um, frontal attacks tend not to end very well in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Civil War. So Lee spots this position and he decides that this is the position that he wants to engage George McClellan and his army. Now, why do I think that? So the reason I think that is because there was a plan that Lee had already started to set in motion or he had in mind after the fall of Harper's Ferry. So after special orders number 191 had been carried out. And this is obvious from paragraph nine of the orders where Lee wrote the commands of Generals John Jackson, Walker, and McClaws, after accomplishing the objects for which they have been detached, will join the main body of the army at Boonesboro or Hagerstown. Now remember, initially, Special Orders Number 191 had stipulated that Longstreet and Hill would remain at Boonesboro uh, well, while the operation at Harper's Ferry were, was going on. But Lee then ended up moving north because he had heard uh, word, gotten word that a federal force was coming down from the north from Pennsylvania. And so he wanted to put Longstreet in a blocking position at, near Hagerstown. However, the Beaver Creek Heights end up being right in between Boonesboro and Hagerstown. So a very convenient place. So Lee also writes uh, later on that he didn't know where, well, we know where that, um, I'm sorry, let me back up here. Lee didn't know where the battle will be fought as of September 8th and 9th because he hadn't seen the terrain yet. But then later after the, on the 11th and afterward, he does see the terrain. And what he writes in his, in his uh, report, his after action report, is that he wanted to threaten Pennsylvania in order to induce the enemy to follow him west of South, of South Mountain. So what he wants to do is he wants McClellan's army to come over the Catoctin Mountain Range, over South Mountain, and be far enough away from uh, Washington and Baltimore and from all of those places where there are possible federal reinforcements um, in order to engage it and destroy it as far away as he could so that something like Second Manassas 
could not happen again because what did John Pope's uh, troops do after the uh, after they were defeated at Second Manassas? They streamed back in uh, in a route, an utter route to um, into the Washington fortifications, and Lee found that he couldn't do anything. So what Lee then intended to do is to induce McClellan to follow him to reconcentrate his army in Washington County at uh, or around Hagerstown, and then to give battle and defeat the Federals far from their reinforcements. And that engagement was supposed to occur at Beaver Creek, five miles northwest of Boonesboro. The uh, arrows that I have here show potential uh, ways that the troops could have come back together in order to uh, meet Beaver Creek, uh, to uh, meet at Beaver Creek Heights or in the, or in the, uh, the Funkstown, the Hagerstown vicinity, right? So Stewart, Jeb Stewart, of course, is supposed to screen the uh, passes uh, over um, uh, the Catoctin Mountains and then fall back gradually to uh, South Mountain and then screen the passes there while D.H. Hill over at Boonesboro is guarding the Army's wagon train. So if Harper's Ferry falls, or once Harper's Ferry falls, Anderson and McClaws can march up Pens uh, Pleasant Valley and then join Hill and then march to, together to meet Longstreet for uh, the Army's concentration near Beaver Creek. Jackson and Walker could then uh, retrace their steps uh, or retrace Jackson's steps through Martinsburg, Williamsport, and then over uh, to join Lee um, from, from that direction. Another marked route potentially is the one that they ended up taking to Sharpsburg, but if uh, it had been necessary to, or there been, had been time in order to uh, join the rest of the army later, um, then uh, 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 they would have marched probably to Sharpsburg and then up the, pi the pike toward Hagerstown and then over across the county in that narrow portion, that narrow neck to uh, Beaver Creek Heights. The problem is, is that Lee's plan was foiled, right? So um, on September 12th and 13th, McClellan ends up, or September 13th, um, McClellan ends up advancing faster than Lee finds convenient. That's a, a term, kind of a, an adaptation of Lee's own term. Um, and the reason that he does that is because McClellan has received special orders number 191, the copy, and he pushes the Ninth Corps uh, quickly behind Alfred Pleasanton's cavalry into Middletown Valley over the Catoctin Mountains, pushes Stewart's uh, troopers all the way back to South Mountain and then sets them up for an attack on Hill uh, on the morning of, um, the, of September 14th. Uh, Lee gets word of this, of course, on the evening of September 13th, and he tries but fails to expedite Jackson's uh, operation, telling him, if you can't bring Harper's Ferry surrender immediately or with very soon, then you need to abandon it and come and join the rest of the army. Uh, and he tells McClaws, on September 14th, uh, in addition to on September 14th, that Longstreet will move down to the Beaver Creek position uh, in order to uh, meet him there. And he sends Pendleton on the 14th, William Nelson Pendleton, uh, the commander of the Army's Reserve Artillery, sends him uh, from Boonesboro, because Pendleton meets Lee in Boonesboro, brings his artillery all the way back there, or all the way down there, he tells Pendleton to retrace his steps and go back to Beaver Creek and establish his artillery on that position, which, um, which Pendleton says that he does. There's a third piece that I haven't uh, really included here in the notes that I'd like to mention as well, which gives me uh, another piece of evidence that Lee intended to fight at Beaver Creek. And that is on the morning of the 14th, despite knowing that, um, that a large federal force had appeared in front of D.H. Hill, uh, Lee does not leave the vicinity of Hagerstown at day, daybreak, as he claims, and as Longstreet claim after, later after the campaign. Uh, he actually hesitates until between 9 and 11 o'clock in the morning after the fighting's already started on Hill's front. And the only reason I can think of that uh, he would want to have, uh, he would have hesitated is he's waiting for word from Jackson uh, to say that Harper's Ferry has been captured. And so Lee wants to pull Hill back from, from South Mountain to the Beaver Creek position and have Jackson come then meet him. Um, because Lee, as he states later uh, uh, after the war, he never intended to fight at South Mountain, was not going to defend uh, at South Mountain. However, the two things, the, two com the confluence of two things on the 14th, the prompt federal attack on D.H. Hill and the failure of Harper's Ferry to fall, that ruins the Beaver Creek plan. Lee can't gather his army there because uh, Jackson is still engaged at Harper's Ferry and Hill is forced to defend the passes on South Mountain. And so Lee is forced then to bring Longstreet and Evans back to, uh, to support Hill. 
But the defeat at, Sh at South Mountain then forces Lee to fall back in the direction of Sharpsburg uh, because it brings him closer to Jackson, gives Jackson a shorter distance to march and McClaws and uh, Anderson and Stewart and Walker. So the, the detached portions of his army that are still in Virginia um, and uh, at the southern, trapped at the southern end of Pleasant Valley, so they can come around and, and come up and meet, uh, meet at Sharpsburg. While he's on the morning of the 15th, while Lee is retiring from Boonesboro, um, he finds the Heights uh, at Sharpsburg, and lo and behold, they look a lot like the Heights at Beaver Creek. There are tall heights behind a water course, right? They're also still in Washington County, and they still enable to Lee to execute his desired Beaver Creek plan, but in a new position um, that he hadn't intended, but he'll make do with it. Uh, and so therefore he fights at Sharpsburg on the 16th and then the 17th because he wanted to encourage uh, the um, uh, secession of uh, Maryland or rebellion to erupt in Maryland. So wrapping up then, I'd like to just talk a little bit up about the implications for the history of the campaign with this kind of, um, this kind of interpretation of the events. The first thing I'd like to mention is that it clarifies Lee's objectives. Um, because Lee's objectives seem to be very amorphous. If you look at histories of the campaign as they're currently written, uh, yes, there are some, some things that he could have accomplished, uh, recruiting food, uh, perhaps getting clothing, um, you know, bringing the war north, et cetera, et cetera. But those are very abstract. Whereas this interpretation of the events based on, uh, on the evidence shows that Lee really wanted to bring the Maryland into the Confederacy. And that the, the, the reason for the Maryland campaign was to bring Maryland into the Confederacy. It was the prize that Lee was seeking. Um, and he, of course, wanted to crush the Army of the Potomac as far from its reserves uh, and supplies. I found no evidence in my research that Lee had intended his campaign as an effort to break the will of the Northern populace to continue the war. That's something that, again, I think comes from the, from the interpretations of the Gettysburg campaign that are then uh, imposed on the history of the Maryland campaign. But I found no evidence. There's no statement by Lee um, of that toward that to that end. Uh, I also found no evidence that Lee took possible European intervention into consideration. Um, there's just, as a matter of fact, the only statement he ever made on it was that we can't rely on uh, outside powers or foreign powers to help us. Uh, we're going to have to do this ourselves if we're going to achieve independence. So. Uh, this interpretation also explains why Lee fought at Sharpsburg and Antietam or Antietam and why he risked staying in place on September 18th after his army had uh, taken a terrible thrashing. Both armies took a terrible thrashing, but his army was smaller, had taken ter a terrible thrashing, but he stays in place anyway. And that's, of course, to, to encourage the secessionist revolt and also to take advantage of perceived enemy de demoralization. Lee really believes, and this is, a, this is something that's well documented, Lee really believes that the Army of the Potomac or the Federal Army as it's been reconstituted under George McClellan um, is uh, highly demoralized and that they won't fight well and that his veterans will be able to defeat them even if they're outnumbered two to one or three to one or however many it, it ended up being. Um, I found no evidence of personal disdain for George McClellan. You'll read in histories such as Landscape Turned Red and anything else that Stephen Sears has ever written, um, where uh, the reason that Lee decided that he was going to fight at, at, at Antietam was because he didn't think McClellan was uh, an opponent who could beat him. And, and he thought that he could beat McClellan. So therefore, uh, that's why he decided to stand. I found no evidence for that whatsoever. That's pure speculation. Um, there's also no evidence that I've found of an attempt by Lee to escape from the Sharpsburg position once he had, uh, had taken it. And the reason that I bring this up is because this is a point that Joseph Harsh makes in, um, in Capture Taken at the Flood, where he argues that Lee never intended to fight at Sharpsburg. He got caught there because McClellan uh, swung around and, uh, and cut off of the Hagerstown Pike in the north, and therefore there was no way that he, um, that, that he could get away. So he was forced into a fight there. Um, I found no evidence for that. Also, and lastly, the loss of special orders num one, number 191 was a, was a significant event and it dramatically altered the, the direction of the campaign. And this is a debate that's currently going on among Maryland campaign historians where you have the people who su have subscribed to Stephen Sears on one side and people who subscribe to the Joseph Harsh School on the other side where Har Stephen Sears says, this was war, potentially war ending intelligence that McClellan received and that he dallied and didn't act on it. Whereas Harsh says that 
It wasn't really war ending. It was three days old, when, four days old when McClellan uh, uh, received the intelligence. And um, he had already pushed the Ninth Corps and his cavalry after Lee um, for the engagement to break out on the 14th of September at South Mountain. Um, but what these, these overlook, these, these, this debate overlooks, I think, is that McClellan moving faster than Lee had uh, anticipated disrupted the trap that he set for McClellan at Beaver Creek. Um, it forced Lee to defend the South Mountain Passes when he never intended to do so. So uh, Longstreet's forced march from Hagerstown back to uh, the vicinity of Boonesboro cost him 50% of his strength. How many of those men ended up returning to the army? I don't know. Did they end up going back to Hagerstown and then crossing over to Williamsport and wait for the army in, in, in Virginia? But the point is, is that um, that uh, long, the, the march, the forced march that was caused by McClellan's action uh, severely weakened um, Longstreet's command. And then of course, there are the battle casualties uh, at South Mountain. Um, it then, there's these actions, these earlier actions then compelled Lee to take up the secondary position at Sharpsburg to fight out a more uh, modified plan, uh, form of his Beaver Creek plan. Um, the problem is, is that the, uh, Army of the Potomac actually had more favorable ground to fight on at Sharpsburg than they would have at Beaver Creek because Lee's left flank is hanging in the air. And so it gives the opportunity for the battle to be fought uh, north of, of uh, the town of Sharpsburg where it ended up being fought. So it really gave McClellan and the Army of the Potomac a, uh, a much better chance. And then of course the compelled force marches as I mentioned by all these different commands significantly reduced um, Confederate combat strength. Uh, and that um, ended up being in McClellan's favor as well. So with that, I will uh, end and um, I'm happy to take questions and look forward to discussion. I'll just leave this here uh, for signed copies uh, of the book. You can go to savisbeatty.com or you can write me at my uh, email address there. And um, I have a price there for $30 plus shipping and handling uh, and I take uh, PayPal. So with that, I will open up to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that uh, talk. A lot of really good information there. Thank and you. I know I saw some questions coming in. And if anyone else has questions, go ahead and add those to the chat. So let's see. The um, Let's see. And I've just now. Should, understood I, stop, that. should I stop sharing uh, um, the slide, Kelly? Sure, you can uh, if you want to. That might. Uh, Let's see. That way we can see each other. All right. Yeah, <laughs> that works. Um, so let's see. Is since there is no evidence that Lee intended his campaign as an effort to strengthen the Copperhead movement. Wait, just a minute. I moved my thing. All right. And actually, let me go up here because it looks like there was an earlier part. So do you think Lee could have invaded the eastern part of Maryland since pro-Confederate sympathy was stronger there? And he goes on to say, uh, one of the prevailing notions about the invasion of Maryland is that Lee's army received a lukewarm reception because they invaded the western region, which was strongly unionist. Right, sure. And that's that's always a big question, right? So when Lee moved to Frederick, why didn't he just advance on Baltimore and uh, and that would have incited the rebellion that he had hoped? Um, there's no evidence that Lee ever considered that. And I think that's because, again, he wanted to draw the Federals west of South Mountain or the west of the Blue Ridge Mountains in order to take them so far away from their supplies and from potential reinforcements that it gave him a better chance to follow up his victory with a march on Baltimore afterward. Because one of the things you need to remember, and this is a theme that comes up over and over again in Lee's writing, and especially in, his, in, in uh, the period, the Jackson Lee period. And this is that um, while they're able to defeat federal forces, they're not able to destroy federal armies and so to, and, and so to win the war. The closest they came was the second Manassas, but then again, it was so close to Washington DC that they were able to, the Federals were able to withdraw, withdraw into the fortifications and it, it makes the victory, it, it lessens the impact of the victory. So you have, so you have successes, vic, successive victories after that, right? You have Fredericksburg, which you know is just frontal attacks again, uh, causing a huge amount of casualties, but we, as we know, the, the Army of the Potomac can replace its replenish its casualties uh, uh, relatively easily, whereas Lee cannot. And then you have Chancellorsville, of course, which is uh, considered to be Lee's masterpiece.
but again, uh, you couldn't follow it up. So uh, was it really uh, was it really a major defeat because the armies just simply go back to the positions they were in before? It ends up being kind of you know moot or what what ends up happening. So I think that that's reason why that Lee ended up moving where he did move rather than moving to the east. That makes sense. So on the uh, kind of the the topic of uh, invasion and uh, that it uh, being kind of a problematic term for Lee's expedition, uh, what do you say about desertion that occurred as as Lee moved into Maryland? So I think the desertion is caused by a couple of things. One is that uh, from the estimates I've seen, and this is a very difficult thing to establish, about a quarter of the army is barefoot. And um, anyone who lives in Maryland or knows the soil around here, it's very rocky. And uh, the roads are not paved. Most of them are not paved, of course, at this time. So it's very difficult for these men to move around. Uh, there are a lot of discussions of uh, how many have um, uh, uh, bleeding sores and cuts on their feet, how many have to fall out on the side of the road because they can't keep up, how many are then put in the wagons uh, because they need to be transported in that, that way. Um, so I think that you know be, being barefoot is really part of the problem for a lot of his army. And that especially becomes the problem when they're taking the national road from Frederick, those troops to take the national road from Frederick up to Hagerstown, because that road is paved, but it's paved with gravel. So if you're barefoot, the last thing you wanna do is walk on gravel. And uh, so they most the, the way the army marched actually was two sets of wagons that would roll down the center of the road. And on either side of the road um, are uh, the columns of troops moving on the in the dirt because they can't, they, a lot of them can't walk in the, uh, in the gravel. So that's, so bare, being barefoot is really a problem for, uh, for Lee's troops. The other thing is that the reception, um, although there are some places, some pockets where their reception is very good and they talk, there are mentions of uh, women setting out tables on the side of the road where they put out water and fruit and all kinds of whatever food they have available to um, uh, for, feder for uh, Confederate troops to eat. There are also a larger number of um, accounts where uh, you have unionist women who are flying uh, American flags and stars and stripes in the faces of Confederate troops. They're, um, they're howling uh, terrible insults at them. They're screaming obscenities at them. They're holding their nose because they smell. I mean, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. So I think that it didn't take long for the rank and file to realize that Maryland was not what they had been, what they had been promised it would have been or, or it would be. And that um, Lee clings to this idea. Even after the campaign, he clings to the idea that Maryland can be brought in, but that or that Maryland wants to come in, but it's just into the Confederacy, but it's just too tightly tied down um, by federal troops. But his troops, they they abandon it entirely. Like I said at the beginning, at the outset um, of my talk, they uh, don't even want to hear the song "My Maryland," "Maryland, My Maryland" anymore. So it just kind of disappears and fades away. So you think it's more a reaction to the the um, lack of welcome that they received as opposed to um, not wanting to take part in an invasion and, and leave their home and right. So that's so that's a different story entirely. That's something that I hear about all the time. But I can tell you that there are only six sources that I've found which say anything about um, not wanting to invade. Uh, another person's country, as they put it at the time, right? Because states were considered countries, basically. Um, and uh, I don't think that you can extrapolate from six accounts or six individual statements of opinion, uh, an army of 55, 60,000 men. I don't think you can, sit, you can do that, especially when there's overwhelming evidence that a far larger number of men at the outset of the campaign really supported um, the invasion uh, or the expedition, uh, and also uh, believed that it was going to be successful. They they really felt like this was it. This was going to be the moment when they win the war, um, and Maryland was going to help them do that. So I don't really believe um, I don't really believe the the I mean I don't believe the the we don't want to invade someone else's country thesis. I I just don't find enough evidence for it. All right. And uh, Dave wants to know, did, uh, he said, since Lee's Maryland campaign report was written after the Gettysburg campaign, do you think that the Gettysburg campaign influenced the way that Lee wrote his Maryland campaign report? 
That's a good question. Um, I don't think so necessarily because uh, the, Lee uses language in his Maryland campaign report that's very consistent with the language that he uses in his dispatches and letters in September of 1862. So there does seem to be a consistency between the, the themes that he's trying to hit, uh, hit there. Okay. And Larry asked, why didn't McClellan attack Lee on September 18th? That's a good question. Um, so uh, McClellan, there are a couple of things. One is McClellan has, his army has suffered a terrible number of casualties uh, on the 17th. And you have to remember that uh, there's a, approximately 20% of the Army of the Potomac um, uh, entered the Maryland campaign, many of these men without even having fired their rifles or without having any drill. So 20% of his strength is uh, McClellan figures he can't rely on it. He's also suffered terribly terrible losses in, in senior commanders. So um, you have a command structure that's broken down. You have a lot of casualties. Um, you also think he also thinks that the, the Confederate Army is 100 to 120 thousand men strong. So uh, he feels like he's done as as much as he can in order to um, forward his objectives. But he doesn't want to risk his army because he feels like if he loses his army, there's nothing that stands between Lee and Baltimore or D.C. or Harrisburg or wherever he thinks that Lee is going. The final point that I would make is that he's already heard that um, as many as um, uh, 15,000 um, militia are coming down from Chambersburg under the command of General John Reynolds. And so he's waiting for reinforcements. Okay. So he waits for the reinforcements to come in and he plans to attack on the 19th. But Lee is, of course, gone by that point. That makes sense. And uh, we'll do one more question here. Uh, Niels asks uh, or says that since there is no evidence that Lee intended the campaign as an effort to strengthen the Copperhead movement or secure European recognition, how do you think these have become prevailing misconceptions about the Maryland campaign? I think, again, it's because people have, instead of looking at what Lee says, what they've done is they've tried to, they've extrapolated from the Gettysburg campaign and from other things. But unfortunately, people, this is true of historians, they tend to try and fill gaps, right? They try and explain things rather than saying, well, this is what the evidence says and, and just simply re reporting that. They try and uh, explain what the evidence might say or what, the, what might be left out. So that's my, that's kind of my opinion of why it is that they that that's there that makes sense well thank you so much for this excellent presentation tonight and yeah. uh so the book is out it's it's there it's for out. you to buy it's uh, out. <laughs> either uh, directly through the the um Sabbath Beatty website or yep. uh, we'll, we'll have it in our shop i'm sure soon uh but you can get it signed from the author which is uh an excellent thing uh, thank you all for tuning in tonight, for watching us, uh, this program. And if you enjoy the, the programs and the talks that we're bringing to you, uh, we certainly uh, welcome your support as a member. And I do see some uh, members out there tonight. Uh, so you can always become a member of the American Civil War Museum by going to our website at acwm.org. Well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Vizzino. It was great having you with us. Uh, lots of food for thought, lots of new information. And everyone have a, a good rest of the weekend, or we, rest of the week. Uh, weekend's coming soon. That's Tomorrow. About right now, yeah. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Thank you, Kelly, thank you. and thank you, everyone.